This episode is brought to you by ShipStation.com. If you sell on eBay, Etsy, or any other online vendor, you've got to check out ShipStation.com. Hello, junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Friday Fix. Today on The Friday Fix, it's a very special Friday Fix. We have with us author Pierce Brown. Hi, everyone. Pierce is the author of Red Rising, which if you guys follow my Twitter, I've gabbed on and fanboyed about uh, quite a lot, and also Golden Sun. Yeah, Golden Sun is the second book of the series. It came out uh, four days ago, or five days ago. And you're on tour right now Uh doing that? This is my last stop in San Diego on tour, yeah. Finish up at Mysterious Galaxy in San Diego? Actually, it's where I started last year for it, so... Yeah, you had the big kickoff party for that last year, Yeah, it was good, and Patrick was one of their first readers. Uh, Patrick runs the sci-fi selection there, yeah. Okay, very cool, very cool. And uh, how many stops on this tour so far? Uh, I was just four stops. Four stops? Yeah, we're just doing uh, West Coast, so I could concentrate on writing book three. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to... Book three. Book three, which is Morning Star. Okay. But I don't want to put the uh, cart before the horse and right. start touring too much and not have the time to write. Right. So it's Red Rising, and then it is Golden Sun, and mm-hmm. then Morning Star. Do you have any idea when that'll be out? <laughs> That's a question I keep getting asked on mm-hmm. Twitter. Um, hopefully early next year, but I guess it depends on my writing process. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And you are with uh, Del Rey, is that correct? Del Rey, yes. yes. Yeah. So now with Alive, my next book, Alive, we're kind of stable mates over there at Del Rey. Yeah, we are. Yeah, I got a copy of it. Getting to work with some of the same people and mm-hmm. uh, watching the, the push they put behind Red Rising, they seem to take their sci-fi very seriously. Seriously there. Yeah, I've, I've found Del Rey to be a great home, both creatively and then how much they've been marketing my book and getting mm-hmm. in front of readers. Because I think we can both agree that sci-fi, sometimes people um, don't know it's a genre they'll like. Mm-hmm. But Del Rey's done a good job, I think, of getting it in front of readers who don't necessarily read sci-fi. Yeah, that seems what they they did quite a job of that with Red Rising. Of course, there's hopes they'll, they'll do something similar with Alive. But Red Rising also really took off on its own, like right out of the gate. That seemed to be a big push behind it, and I mean, you've already optioned it for a movie, is that correct? Uh, yeah, we optioned it uh, la- beginning of last year. For It's with Universal right now. With Universal. Uh, so there was a bidding war between Sony and Universal for mm-hmm. the rights, and then uh, Mark Forster, um, the director of World War Z, uh, came on to direct it. Okay. So, and I'm writing the script. And you're writing the script. And I have wh- written the script, so it took up a big chunk of time last year. Oh, that, yeah. that cuts into the right. Now, oh, was that something you had to negotiate for? Because, you know, you're no- yeah. nobody, no one, nowhere, and you're, here you are, the first book. Get it option and writing your own script. Yeah, it took a little bit of time. But, you know, the first time when we started taking it out, it was right after John Carter had uh, come out. So when we first took Red Rising, the project out, trying to get film studios interested. Mm -hmm. And as soon as John Carter came out for about like six or seven months, you know, Mars was... Uh, planet ah. non grata yeah <laughs> it wasn't allowed to really be talked about They're like so could you move it to earth or maybe even <laughs> venus um and i'm like well but blue rising just doesn't have the same right. quality tone to it but um yeah so it's with uh mark who's a really talented director and his vision for it so far is just amazing okay um and we did have to negotiate it obviously when i was going in and finding the right home between sony and universal but that's is, that's yeah. quite that's quite successful. I mean, uh, having been, had things optioned, et cetera, having some familiar with the process, if that thing gets made mm-hmm. and you've written the screenplay, you've now leveraged yourself into not only having a su- successful book series, but can spring off, uh, like Seth Graham Smith, for example, people who can spring off and write other screenplays. Was that part of the plan from Square One, or was this opportunistic? Yeah, it's, it's still part of the plan. I mean, I'm still I, I'm writing shows right now, which I'm hoping to take out this year, mm-hmm. um, television shows. Um, sci-fi, some high concept ones. And so it's always what I've wanted to do is work in different mediums. Okay. You know, it's the same thing as like someone like a Patrick Rothfuss doing a children's novel mm-hmm. or a kind of children's novel. Kind of. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah a dark, dark, <laughs> twisted one. Yeah. Um, but it, it, I think it's just the same thing when, as we get into an age where um, artists have to be more diverse in how they're putting out content and how they're deriving um, uh, funds from that content because there are so many choices out there mm-hmm. that I think the artists have to be able to dip their fingers in a different medium. But quick take on your background. What yeah. what did you do before you said, screw it, I'm writing a book? And Red Rising isn't your first novel, is that correct? You no, ramped no, your way I, up. I wish it was. Um, no, I, I wrote six books before I wrote Red Rising. I was rejected by, I think, maybe 60 agents, all told. Nice. Um, but probably 130 different rejections over the course of seven, six or seven years while I was actually getting decent at writing. Mm-hmm. And then Red Rising um, kind of came to me r- right before I was going to stop writing completely because I'd, I'd written a lot and then I was going to focus on a career. Okay. I actually have to earn some money because I was just getting $10 an hour where I was. Right. And then... Um, so I was in politics for a little while, working on a political campaign. I worked for 
Um, started a tech company. I worked for an online magazine. I worked as an NBC page. Mm -hmm. uh, so I won, wore one of those peacock ties. I looked adorable. <laughs> and, I gave, and I gave tours. Yeah, all my friends called me Kenneth, <clears throat> Kenneth the Page. Oh, so, very cool. Yeah, that was fun. Well, that's, uh, and a lot of people, when they look at people who are breaking out, you know, the overnight sensation that is Pierce Brown took years and years to get there. And it's, it's very similar to my background, over 100 rejections, like that was the currency. Yeah, you, I think you and I talked about this yeah. when we first met. That's, we that's the cost yeah. to be the boss, you know, you got to get rejected a lot as you get mm -hmm. better. And I was also at the same point, like, okay, we're doing this, and then that's it. If this doesn't go, it's time to focus uh, on the career, yeah. and, that, and then it took off. And the good thing about the rejections is you learn. I mean, it's like getting the question wrong in a test. Mm -hmm. You're always going to remember that, the one you got wrong, probably. I mean, at least that's how I work, and I'm pretty sure it's the same way you work. But also, it makes you not afraid anymore. Yeah. In terms of like you've been rejected that many times, you know, you know, and it you're still standing. Uh, you're much nicer than I am. Every time <laughs> I got a rejection letter, it's like I'm gonna show you. Uh, well, I'll I mean, I'll put it right in your face someday. They, I do have the, all the rejection letters up, <laughs> up on my up on my bathroom, so it, it, you know you know where you can put them. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, you do. Uh, you learn a lot from that, but the the motivation is there, and a uh, lot of. Uh, a lot of people who watch my shows are writers, aspiring writers. The thing is, when you make it your goal to collect rejection letters, like I'm going to get to X number of rejection letters before mm -hmm. I worry, that takes a lot of the pressure off too. It does, and you're like, yeah. oh, there's another one. I'm closer. You expect them at that point, yeah. you know, and the odds are against you. But the thing is, they, you know, like Han Solo said, never tell me the odds. Right? <laughs> He's ro Josh is rolling his eyes over there. but no, it's, we, we knew we weren't going to get out of here with the Star Wars reference. No, no, no. Pretty much. Least, uh, probably two left at this point. Two yeah. left. Uh, now... Talk about Golden Sun a little, and then yeah. we have uh, I tweeted out that people who could send questions for this. So I've oh, got great. several yeah. questions from your fans, which are, are really good questions. Um, I read Red Rising. I went nuts for it. Uh, was I was fortunate enough to have a blurb for it that they used. Yeah, yeah. And you were right on the front with me. <laughs> it was right on the front. That was kind of <laughs> cool. I think cool. your name might have been bigger than my name at first. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I through you, I got to see my name up on the screen before a Twilight movie. So that hey, worked well, out. Or was it Hunger Games or Twilight I, they advertised for? I hope it was Hunger Games. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, think I, it, I think it was Hunger Games. But yeah. Why were you at a Twilight movie? Uh, because somebody told me <laughs> that they were running ads for... I believe him. Yeah. I believe him. And uh, I was like, yes. Uh, okay, I like Bella. What do you want from me? <laughs> hey, she's cute. Uh, what do you want from me? I'm Team Edward. I can't help myself. So Red Rising is the story of... It's, a inter it's not an intergalactic. It's an intersolar system culture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And kids from higher, upper crust are brought in to compete for uh, to get on the leadership track, mm -hmm. so to speak. And I don't want to give too many spoilers because I know a lot of yeah. people on Red Rising. What can you tell us about Red Rising so then I can talk about Golden well, Sun? Very briefly, the idea is that 700 years from now, humanity has expanded into a solar system and has begun terraforming the planets and the moons um, in order to sustain human life. And they've also created a society that is rigidly hierarchical where you have uh, various people given... Um, better treatment in society because of the color of their irises. So golds, who are um, eugenically uh, modified mm -hmm. um, through science and through breeding patterns, to be superior. So they're seven foot tall, beautiful people that are also brilliant. Mm -hmm. And so they have everything. They're the peak of society. And then you have various colors throughout society which have different roles. And red is the bottom, and they're the manual laborers. And Red Rising is about a red infiltrating the school where they train the best and the brightest of the golds. Mm -hmm. And it's about him trying to carry out a rebellion um, through the course of the novel. Whereas Golden Sun is then what happens after that school, what happens in the larger scheme of things, what happens when it expands and you have warring, feuding families, mm -hmm. much like a Game of Thrones in space. Yeah, a lot of people are, yeah it's yeah. very similar to Game of Thrones in space. Yeah. Which I, I always u hate using other people's work to compare it your own, but it's an easy macro way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it's like Game of Thrones and Count of Monte Cristo in space. Count of Monte Cristo in space. Yeah, that's my jam. I love Count of Monte yes. Cristo. There's so. a lot of, uh, lot of mythical references and you built this whole structure. And a structure that holds up pretty well. Uh, one of the things I liked, wanted to ask you about, is most... People write sci-fi, star-spanning sci-fi. It's all over the place. And you and James S.A. Corey with the Expanse series. Great series, by the way. That great series. Yeah. Keep it locked into our solar system, which is sort of a simple idea, and yet at the same time, sort of re not revolutionary, but like now I can really identify because these are planets I know. Mm -hmm. I can read about them. I can Google these things. Was this, some, was this a conscious choice to keep it in the solar system? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that the emotional attachment that people have to the planets or to the mythology behind Mars mm -hmm. or Venus or whatnot is very influential in how we understand our solar system. And I think it's also influential in the themes I use. 
um, within the Red Rising series. But, you know, James S.A. Corey, those two guys are way smarter than I am. <laughs> There's just much more hard sci-fi than mine, yeah. whereas I would look at mine as like a fantasist's sci-fi. Yes. Like Star Wars is fantasy wearing sci-fi clothing, mm -hmm. which is what Red Rising is. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it has science fiction elements to it, but also has these almost a fantasy storytelling, you know, in terms of how it begins and then how the course of the story goes mm -hmm. it's like a space opera which is fantasy and uh for for my fans watching this if you're familiar with uh, infected focuses on one guy in his situation and then contagious broadens that out to the uh american response to it and then finally pandemic is a global response i saw red rising is just the school focusing mm -hmm. on our lead character darrow and then as we get to golden sun the shit hits the fan, yeah. and now we are getting into the much shit hits the fan, the yeah. much bigger picture of yeah. of more, it's more it's Mars centric, but yet it is a much Mar bigger Mar picture. Yeah, Mars is always the soul, you know, mm -hmm. it's the same, and it's the same staging as you had, you know, very small. Uh, we start very small in the mines, and then we just expand, 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 mm -hmm. and that way I think that it's a good way to build and a good way for world building itself, so you can identify and have. Uh, feelings about the world building that you've seen, the small microcosm. So when you see the macrocosm, you understand, you know, why the Shire right. matters in the scheme of right. things, for instance. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's the best world building I've ever seen is the Shire and then the journey outward from there in uh, Lord of the Rings. And like Lord of the Rings, like George R. R. Martin's work, uh, your if your book is a sentence, a giant ass battle is the punctuation at the end of that sentence. And Golden Sun builds up to quite, uh, I thought it was a, just... A fantastic battle scene. Thanks. Crazy carnage. The body counts uh, off the charts. <laughs> yeah. And, and that gets me to the question of, did you know which characters are going to live to book three, or are you done with book two, and now you pick up the pieces, and then you write book three? So book two, I knew everyone who was going to die. Mm -hmm. um, book one, I didn't. So book one, I had one character at the end who reaches his demise, and... Um, how do I say this? I put their name, all the names of the, my favorite characters into a hat and I pulled one out <laughs> because the point of death in war a lot of times is the capriciousness of it, mm -hmm. the pointlessness of it. And when he is killed or when this character dies, <clears throat> it doesn't make any sense. But, you know, I can't do that all the time. Sure. Then, then that, I feel like that's throws off your structure. Yeah, too, yeah, exactly. It throws off your structure like crazy. Mm -hmm. But I had an opening and I wanted to do that. And I wanted it to hurt. And unfortunately, it was with one of my favorite characters. But I told myself I was going to stick did with you, that. Did you put the name back in the head? <laughs> I, I, I was tempted to. <laughs> uh, if it would have been Darrow, I would have had to. Darrow's the main character. Well, yeah, he's, he's First franchise. First person perspective. Yeah, I can't really do that. Yeah. Franchise. All right. Now, uh, I want to ask some of the questions that have come in from your fans. Sure. No particular order to these. But uh, one from Adam Ellsworth, which I liked. What are the mood stages of your writing and who has to deal with them? <laughs> well, one of my friends is here with us right now. So he has to hear me ranting and raving when I get a bad uh, note from someone. Mm -hmm. um, but my mood stages, you know, it's, it's directly influenced by what I, like how much progress I've made during the day. And you know what it's like mm -hmm. when you write those four or five hours and you have like 10, 12 pages and you're so proud of it and you're happy and you're free the rest of the day, right? But right. it's those days when you have one or two pages done and it's taking you the entire day and you export that stress into the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And that's when you start becoming uncomfortable in the writing process. Right. Um, so that, then I take it out on pretty much everyone because I get a little bit sullen or like a little bit short tempered because I'm thinking about the story while having a conversation with them. You can't focus on exactly. normal life. Exactly. Right. And, you're not, and you're not yourself. So you're not as smart as you want to be. You're not as clever as you want to be. You're mm -hmm. not as in touch with people. And then you start being upset because you know that weakness is there, you know? Do the people around you get that, though? Do they go, ah, my, Pierce my, is in this world? My friends are good, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm really blessed with some amazing friends who get me, and sometimes they say, maybe you should go home. <laughs> I do get, even from my business partner, sometimes I'll get this, like, hey, yeah. I, this the conversation here. And you're like, yeah. oh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I was lost in that other no, no, area. So my, my sister and I have a thing. If, I, if I'm being peevish with her, mm -hmm. then she's allowed to say, Xena, warrior princess, and I have to, like, I'm like, oh, okay, take a step back. I'm being an asshole. So I probably should stop. Do you have to do any imaginary sword play? No, 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 no. Nothing no, like no. that? I do a shock room thing when okay. Zena catches. Like, that's there bad. you go. Yeah. There you go. Here's a question from Freddie Smith. What, and was the end of Golden Sun supposed to be so tragic? Well, without giving away spoilers, yes, it was. Okay. Um, mostly because um, the loneliness of, our, of Darrow is... Uh, the, second book is uh, the second book is about trust. Mm -hmm. And... He, Darrow tr learns to trust some people, learns to not trust others. And I think that what happens at the end of the book is directly correlated to the lesson he's learned through the course of the book mm -hmm. and also through the promises that 
uh, others have made to him, as well as the hunches he should have had along the way. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy if you look back on it or you reread or you remember uh, conversations he had early, with earlier individuals. I mean, you see it coming, and the fact that you see it coming doesn't change it. You can't stop it. Right. And the fact that you see it coming... Is that more the reader sees it coming or the Darrow reader, sees the reader. it coming? Darrow can't see it coming. Right. And that's we, we begin to see how he's changed, mm -hmm. how confident he is in perhaps a bad wrong way it's that hubris which he's always been told to guard himself from right mm -hmm. and in the end maybe he is achilles so it is an interesting thing to look at we've got but, but yes it was meant to be tragic meant to be tragic you well, you wonder sometimes if those things sneak up on uh, on the writer because there's a couple scenes where i did mention a giant ass body count there's a couple scenes where you're it's like pretty big Whoo, man, that got that jumped up a notch. That escalated. Yeah. yeah that, so, much, so like, okay, I'm notorious for my my editor, uh, Mike Braff at Delray, who's amazing. Great guy. But he, um, I'll give him. An, I'm I'm really bad at outlining. I've heard this term pantser, so I'm much more of a pantser. Oh, like see the right, pants. See the okay. pants. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I write like that. So I'll give him an outline, and it's like ludicrous how different it is from the final thing I turn in. Mm -hmm. Josh and I are working on some TV projects, and it's the same way. Like Josh will see. Uh, the outline, then he'll get the script. He'll be like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> um, so Mike was that way near the end of the book. I didn't tell him it was coming. Oh, good. Well, that's uh, it's nice to get a gut check out of your editor, too. Yeah, you want to see how it plays. Completely. And he was wondering where, where it was going, and when it happened, he just threw the book at the wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you get. That's what you get. All right. A couple from uh, Hope Jones. Uh, first one is, is it easier for you to write action scenes or love scenes? Not that there's an enormous amount of love scenes in in the series but the ones that are I mean, there love, love are really can be action scenes right they can be yeah <laughs> yeah kind of cling on action going on there yeah, but right. no the, the the few love scenes you have interspersed through are they're mostly gut punching like yeah. oh it's really we've watched people slaughter each other and now we move on to this thing and it's equally as gripping but what is easier for you to write easier for me to write the action scenes but i prefer writing them for quiet moments mm -hmm. um one of the things that sometimes i feel trapped by is how kinetic darrow is is he's always doing something, always having to change something, and he's always active. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that gets in the way of the self-reflection and character growth, which I want him to have. Okay. And so these scenes, like these chapters where it's just a conversation with him and someone he loves, are so monumentally important to his character, to the changing of the tone of the book, mm -hmm. and also to my understanding and the reader's understanding of what he's doing and why he's doing it. Okay. Because he does some abhorrent things. Mm, he has but, to, yeah. But through those love scenes, or scenes of love is probably a better way to uh, say it, um, you get the self-reflection. You see the toll it takes. Mm -hmm. And I think anyone who's gone through anything dramatic can understand what the toll is a lot of times. And it's usually found through those interactions with someone you know and love. And how's it changed? How's it changed after the moment of that, you know, something that makes uh, that the action scene, after something mm -hmm. that changes your life, how is that interaction with them now different? And Darrow, in a lot of ways, uh, he is a hero. He's got the righteous cause, at least in his eyes. Yet, but in the larger structure of society, he's an absolute, he's a terrorist. Mm -hmm. He's a terrorist, he is giant terrorist. body and count, no rebelling against it, yeah. authority. And you're and, and through this series, you are watching him come to grips with the monster that he is justifying himself to be to mm -hmm. achieve his goal. How much has that impacted you as you write to realize, yeah, this guy is, uh, depending on how you look at it, he's an awful, awful person. Well, you know, if you look at the title Morningstar for the third book, mm -hmm. uh, Morningstar is referenced twice in the Bible, once alluding to Satan, once alluding to Jesus. Okay. And so I think that that can show the dichotomy of an individual or the dichotomy that Darrow is, you know, because every book title has been about him. He's mm -hmm. the Red Rising, he's uh, Golden Sun, he's Morningstar. And so the perspective and how you look at it is so important to the series because there's people who I love as characters like Cassius who are so unbelievably twisted and tortured by the events that have happened, mm -hmm. which are all the fault of Darrow well, to a degree. Okay, they're almost all the fault of Darrow. Right. But he's twisted and people don't like Cassius. Some people like him, but I like him because I know he's such a sad character. He wants to live in a world where there is honor, but mm -hmm. he, there is no honor in this world. And that dissonance between... The relationship he wants to have with people and the relationship he has to have or does have, you know, with like Darrow in particular, kind of breaks him mm -hmm. and turns him into, like, I'd say that he was a, um, what is it, an eagle that's turned into a carrion bird. Okay. And I think that's nice. the saddest transformation. And, you know, right. Darrow was responsible for it. Yeah. Cassius and is like, in, in the Greek tragedy that you're, kind of is your book, he's one of the more tragic characters, He is, because right? he, in another world, he would have been Darrow. Mm -hmm. In his world, he would be Darrow if, mm -hmm. he, if he was He'd on the, the hero. side. Yeah. yeah. And, and he still might have the chance to be in the third book. Uh, <clears throat> here's one I'm sure you're not going to answer, but from, uh, <laughs> from Benjamin. The Jackal, that's a character in the book, the Jackal quotes Paradise Lost in Chapter 51, so he is the Morning Star, right? That's another thing. <laughs> 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 um, 
Serving yeah, it was re- re- b- book three. Read book read three. Read book three. Okay. <laughs> um, also, I'm writing book three, so I, I've yet to um, gloss that one out fully. And speaking of book three, uh, Shani Ferguson asks, does it bother you how many depressed people will be walking around waiting for book three? I live off that shit. <laughs> no. <laughs> Scott, you know that. Oh, yes. Your, your, your tears give me power. Of exactly. course. I think of I course. saw that, that meme for George R. R. Martin, and I'm like, said every author ever. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Because it means you're touching someone. You know, It means that you are getting inside. Mm-hmm. And if um, you're doing that, then you're doing your job, right? Now, here's one I like, because I have the mm-hmm. same question. And this is from Rebecca Rendon. And... You like like Star Wars, like swashbuckling stories. You go um, out of your way to establish a lot of mano a mano honor type duels, mm-hmm. where we are doing I'm me versus you with identical weapons. Let's have at it. But your weapons are really unique. They can be a sword. They can go stiff. They can then become a whip. They can. He's talking about the razor. The razor, yeah, the razor. They can wear them around their arm. They can do all of these different things. Which with I them. should have given a cooler name because now they're talking about trademarking stuff, and you can't trademark razor. You can't trademark razor. <laughs> yeah. No, I should have been like razor with two Z's. Yeah, the whip it with two the, P's the, and an the, L. The, the razor whip it. The razor whip it. So, <laughs> what? What now? Of course, if it's the classic Romeo and Juliet type style or Shakespeare, mm-hmm. we've got the swords and we go at it. Um, what was behind? coming up with the unique weapon, but still would give you that swashbuckling feel, that honor duel type feel. Yeah, so I didn't really uh, create a series Bible at the beginning, mm-hmm. but I did create a technology chart mm. so I can know the rules okay. that I was playing within. And the razor was one of the first things I created um, because in sci-fi, I feel like there's uh, sometimes you can lose the dramatic tension because of the size of the warfare, the size of the world, the size of everything. You know, Star Wars did such a great job of um, boiling down the tension, I'm uh, creating tension mm-hmm. and also making it about the characters when they're in dogfights by making it like World War II dogfights, mm-hmm. right? So I thought, how can I remove technology but also make this a highly technological world, you know? How can I make it about the characters, make it about their actions? Mm-hmm. So I basically have technology that is so good that it surpasses the other technology that, you know, sure. that you sure. usually see in sci-fi. So, uh, you know, um, like in Dune, Dune also did it wonderfully. The personal shields that they wear, mm-hmm. the only way for them to be penetrated is by a slow-moving blade. Right. You which is in close. fascinating. And so it makes them a knife culture, mm-hmm. right? And that's a fascinating take on it because almost every other space opera has laser cannons, you know, and right. Dune does, of course, as well, but not for the uh, the elite who can afford these I mean, shields. Even, right? even modern-day weaponry, mm-hmm. the, uh, fi- the fighter jocks can kill from four or five miles away and never see exactly. anything, and that so takes a lot of it out dramatic? of it. Yeah. Exactly, so you have to have something that neutralizes that, you mm-hmm. know, and throughout the course of the Red Rising series, you also see the use of EMPs. So what happens when you deprive all technology? Mm-hmm. You know, but a lot of it was, uh, so how can I make it about, how can I make the fighting emotional? Mm-hmm. How can I make it um, Shakespearean or operatic right. um, without, you know, removing the human element? Which was, uh, for me, that's a lot of the fun of the series, is you've got this incredibly advanced, high culture, the richest people that have ever been. You can draw allusions to it no matter what culture you come from. And repeatedly, you drag these people down into the dirt, covered in mud, in effect, using sticks and rocks yeah. to determine who is primal and who's going to live and who's going to die. Mm-hmm. And it, that is a technique you're using to get us in touch with those characters, or is it just naturally flow that way? Um, naturally flows that way for the story, mm-hmm. fortunately, but also it is a technique to get you to like them. But even more specifically, it's a thematic exploration of their, their culture. Okay. Because they're a culture that um, is the most decadent that has ever lived, but they're mm-hmm. also the most aggressive. And the only reason they can be so decadent is because, so they have, there's like, you know, 100 million golds, maybe more. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, a few more than 100 Out million. of roughly? Uh, um, out of uh, 17 billion people in society. Okay. So there's 11 million, I'm sorry, 100 million golds, but there's only 144,000 peerless guard. Mm-hmm. And these are the elites. These are the ones that um, you follow the story with. And they're the ones with the razors. They're the ones who are only allowed to carry it. And they are just the most primal and vicious that mankind has ever offered. They're the Spartans right. of their society, but they support the decadence of the hundred million other golds. Mm. And so okay. it's interesting seeing the dichotomy even there between um, that elite warrior caste that looks down at the people that they have to protect and who uphold their society mm-hmm. just the same way. So there's hierarchy within hierarchy within hierarchy. And the uh, what I think is so interesting is that the height of that hierarchy is the... Um, is unable to escape that dirt under the nails, the, you know, the rusty knife in the back. Right, 
Right. Because at their level, at the peerless guard level, they are all roughly equals, and it comes down to... Roughly, yes. Yeah, it comes yeah. down to who, who wants it more, to go with yeah. sports terminology. Mm-hmm. Who's willing to go all the way and backstab and betray and attack? Because they're, they're all quite talented and quite intelligent, mm-hmm. you know? And you can't just have, you know, uh, three bright characters in the book. Yeah. It wouldn't be realistic. Well, that's, that, that is part of the enjoyment, that all of Darrow's foes... There are no pansies. There's no easy setup character yeah. in this. Oh, he's going to take out that guy. That guy's, you know, they're, yeah. everybody's dangerous and deadly and, and they smart. they play to their strengths. Yeah. Yeah, which makes it a bitch to write sometimes. <laughs> you got to cover all those bases. Plans within plans within plans. Here's a good one from Cole Strelho. This is good structure in this question. On a right. scale of Attack of the Clones to Return of the Jedi. Oh, I like this guy. How much did you enjoy the Star Wars references in Golden Sun? Oh, it's it's what I live off. Of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a Josh Whedon one. Uh, there's a Hobbit reference. Okay. There's um, a Three Musketeers reference. There's tons of stuff in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those are just like the crumbs for me and for uh, dedicated readers like yeah. yourself. It's yeah. get, it, it, it gets giddy to put those in yeah, there. Yeah, and it's also to be like I'm on you, I'm on your level. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah. I, yeah. That's about it, a lot of yeah, it. Yeah, and it's it's a fun wink to someone who's part of the same club you are. Uh, a lot. And recognizing those jokes means we're the same. We're club. We're the same club. I, yeah. I drop in a lot of '80s buddy cop references. Into <laughs> into my books, a lot, lot yeah. of lethal weapon yep. in my books, uh, and wait for you know people in that club. To, did you just mention that? Yes, I did. Thank yeah. you. That's yeah. almost as good as you crying from the book. That that's right a, there. That's just the nudge, right? Yeah, yeah. a little nudge, yeah. little nudge. Last question I got, and uh, you may opt out of this if you like, but let's see. From Red Hell Diver. Which oh. is one of your fan your so fan they group. Hate the, you hate the book. Yeah, they tell. can stand yeah. it. Uh, how did you envision the Laurel Tide dance? Was it like River Dance? Was it like the Running Man, <laughs> the Dougie, and a hundred house points if you give a demo? Um, no, no, jo- Josh, I brought you for a prop. Uh, I-, I could be like an old red who's been crippled by the mines, and I would just sit here and just be like, "There you go." Yeah. Um, but but it's a lot like um um. Hmm, what's the best? Uh, not, not the river dance. The river dance. <laughs> They're not linking arms. No. Um, I would say a lot like. Uh, oh, here, here's a good explanation. Uh, Titanic, in the bowels of the ship, when Leonardo DiCaprio takes uh, Kate Winslet yes. down there. Yeah. It's like that. Yeah. It's the it's the drunken dancing of. Irish goons. <laughs> that, that's actually what I kind of visualize the yeah, first it, time. I'm like, this is a bunch of drunk Irish people. Yeah, and I think I think that um, yeah, exactly. It's a bunch of drunk people having fun, and mm-hmm. it's not. It's rhythmic, is what it is. If okay. Anything. And um, within it, um, there's none of there's none of because what Reds are, they're all about transferring momentum, transferring pain into love, mm-hmm. momentum into more movement. I mean, it's the same thing with the drill. If you um, pause in the, when you're on the claw drill, you can jam a um, jam a gear and burn up the drill. It's, it's the same thing as like Darrow's father always told him to um, go with the velocity that you're at and then mm-hmm. just shift and don't slow down because if you slow down, you'll get hurt. Mm-hmm. And that's the same thing if you're skiing. If you try to slow down, then you, that's when you get hurt. Which is the metaphor he carries on in his exactly. work against the goals. Exactly, yeah. particularly in his method for delivering violence. Mm-hmm. And so reds are the same way when they're dancing. So it's like imagine a bunch of drunken people stumbling places, but doing it in this sort of rhythmic, interesting, fun, happy way. Yeah. And at the end of the night, most of them are passed out. I would imagine something like <laughs> yep. that. Yep. Most of them are. <laughs> when you're doing it right, that's hey, how it ends up. Brother, all I know is if we were with them, we'd do that first. <laughs> their, their, their tolerance is better than ours. That would be ideal. All right. Uh, that is, uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up. And awesome. where do people find out more about you? Um, they can go to www.pierce-brown.com. Or find me on Facebook or Twitter, uh, Pierce underscore Brown on Twitter, or Instagram, Pierce Brown Official. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm you know, new generation. We do Instagram. We do pictures. Instagram's I going only, really I, well I, for you. Yeah. Well, I only have like uh, two selfies on there, so I'm, I'm pretty happy. <laughs> and I, I, I've, you know, I have about 14 dog pictures. So well, I if do. You, I, if you like dog pictures. If you came here, I want a picture with you oh. and my dog oh, yeah, on your you, Instagram. You and me, selfie dog. Yeah, right? selfie dog. All right. Perfect. All right. Thanks Perfect. for coming out, man. Thanks for having me, buddy. See you, junkies. Peace.